1932 Experiment. And it seems so simple. And here we are 40 years later. It clearly wasn't quite as simple as it seemed. We're testing the most fundamental theory of physics. Go for launch. I'd like to be able to tell my grandchildren that we either validated or, or invalidated some of Einstein's thinking. I mean, I think that's 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 pretty cool. <laughs> boils down to a simple question. Was Einstein's view of the universe right, or was it wrong? George Bernard Shaw at a banquet honoring Einstein. Napoleon and other great men of his type, they were makers of empire. But there is an order of men who get beyond that. They are not makers of empire, but they are makers of universe. are unstained by the blood of any human being on earth. Ptolemy made a universe which lasted 1,400 years. Newton also made a universe which has lasted 300 years. Einstein has made a universe, and I can't tell you how long that will last. <laughs> Isaac Newton was one of the greatest scientists of all time. He formulated the laws of gravitation and motion and the forces in our day-to-day -day life. These are the forces that move the planets around the sun, keep us standing on the ground, and shoot billiard balls across the pool table. For 200 years, the Newtonian universe was indeed the pinnacle of science. At the end of this period, James Clerk Maxwell formulated the laws of electromagnetism. He emphasized for the first time the fundamental importance of the speed of light and gave us a new force that generates electricity and keeps the compass needle aligned. But the laws of Newton and Maxwell failed to describe the world of the very small. Scientists like Max Planck Erwin Schrödinger, Werner Heisenberg, Richard Feynman, and many others formulated our view of nature at its tiniest scale. This is the realm of atoms, their nuclei, and quarks, the world of the very small, the world of quantum mechanics. From television to atom bombs, quantum mechanics has fundamentally transformed our everyday life. On the other end of the scale, Albert Einstein invented our modern understanding of the fabric of the universe. His ideas lead us into the realm of cosmology, where the universe is seen as a whole, with galaxies billions of light years away. And into a galaxy, where in its very center, millions or even billions of stars are condensed into a supermassive black hole. This is the realm of the very large and the very massive. This is Einstein's universe. 
It started in 1905 when Einstein published his special theory of relativity and changed Newton's absolute properties of space and time forever, weaving them together into a relativistic space-time continuum. Nothing can travel faster than light, and the speed of light itself is combined with mass and energy in his famous formula E equals mc squared. The equation E is equal mc squared. Then in 1916, Einstein published his general theory of relativity, where he had now combined space and time with gravity. A complete and utter departure from Newton's law of gravity and gave to the world an elegant, relativistic theory of our universe. Gravity is no longer Newton's force in absolute space and time, but rather the curvature of space-time itself. Einstein's four-dimensional space-time is a place where space-time grips matter, telling it how to move, and matter grips space-time, telling it how to curve. Today, quantum mechanics and general relativity are the two pillars of modern physics. However, their mathematical languages are completely incompatible. Quantum mechanics is written in the language of particles, waves, probabilities, and path integrals. General relativity is written in the entirely different language of geometry and geodesics. But if the mathematical languages of quantum mechanics and general relativity are so entirely different from each other, how do we know that general relativity really describes the universe accurately? The validity of quantum mechanics is demonstrated every day. Our understanding of the atomic world has brought us our modern technology from television to atom bombs. But much less evidence exists in favor of general relativity. In the realm of black holes and the universe on a grand scale, the language of general relativity is spoken, and it's spoken very loudly. But here in our tiny solar system, general relativity is spoken with but a whisper. However, we cannot go to a black hole to test general relativity. We are stuck in our solar system. So we test general relativity here, but then with the utmost sensitivity. That is the goal of the Gravity Probe B mission. I like to think of Gravity Probe B as a sandwich. We are testing the most fundamental theory of physics. In order to do that test, we need to do an immense amount of very sophisticated engineering. And in order to do that engineering, we need to make use of the principles and techniques of quantum mechanics. To actually make all this happen, we have to build a collaboration between physicists and engineers at the real working level. And in doing that, we've had great benefit from the infrastructure that one finds at a place like Stanford University and in Silicon Valley. A few predictions of general relativity have been tested so far, but only with relatively moderate sensitivity. There is first the perihelion precession a small correction of the orbital motion of the planet Mercury, the planet closest to our sun. Then the light bending effect, which appears to shift the stars around a massive body, like our sun, away from it. And, closely related, the Shapiro delay, which has the effect of delaying in time a signal when it passes close to a massive body, like our sun. Further, the motion of the binary pulsar, which provides us with the first indirect, but very good, evidence of gravitational radiation. And finally, the gravitational redshift measured by NASA's Gravity Probe A mission, which makes clocks go faster when they move away from a massive body like the Earth. 
Troubled by the shortcomings of the few tests of general relativity, an extremely sensitive experiment was suggested by Leonard Schiff of Stanford University and independently also by George Pugh of the US Defense Department with a freely spinning gyroscope in a polar orbit around the Earth. Here, the gyroscope is a small sphere surrounded by a satellite. This is a gravity probe beam mission. And so one of the gyroscopes of the four gyroscopes in gravity probe B is, is freely falling about the Earth. And so we adjust the spacecraft so that it flies literally around the one gyroscope. Gravity probe B is an almost perfect space-time reference system. Where the, it is a pure physics experiment where the apparatus is under the experimenter's control. We're going to be measuring the geodetic effect, which measures the curvature of space-time by means of perfect, well, almost perfect gyroscopes moving around at the Earth. Due to this geodetic effect, the spin direction of the gyroscope would move slowly due to curved space-time by 6.6 .6 arc seconds per year. More exciting, we're going to be measuring the frame-dragging effect. The frame-dragging is an extraordinary prediction that physicists Josef Lenzer and Hans Thiering made just two years after Einstein's formulation of general relativity. Due to this prediction of Einstein's formulation, a massive body, when it rotates, should literally drag the curved space-time around with it. Therefore, the gyroscope spin direction should turn also, perpendicularly and much more slowly by 42 thousandths of an arc second per year. For a black hole in comparison, frame dragging is enormous. Like the air in a whirling tornado, the whirling space around a black hole has an enormous destructive potential. It may in fact be responsible for the power generation in some of the most explosive objects that live in the universe, the quasars at the distant reaches of our universe. This form of warping has never ever been seen by humans with confidence or in detail. This is the dragging of space into motion by the movement of matter, such as the spin of the Earth. Gravity probe B will reveal that to us in detail. The goal of Gravity Probe B is to measure these motions with respect to the distant universe with an accuracy of better than one hundredths of a percent of the geodetic effect and better than one percent of the frame dragging. How exactly does Gravity Probe B work? The experiment is done inside an Earth orbiting satellite. It contains a small tracking telescope pointed to a guide star. A sun shield is mounted in front of the telescope's lens. Solar panels provide the power for the electrical components. The main element of the satellite is a vessel, the Dewar, that is filled with liquid helium. It cools the interior to a temperature of very near absolute zero and maintains this temperature for the life of the mission. Inside the Dewar, superconducting lead foils shield the scientific instruments from the Earth's magnetic field. Here is the heart of the satellite, the physical probe, which is kept at high vacuum for extreme stability. It consists of the tracking telescope, sighted on a guide star and bonded to a quartz block that houses gyroscopes. For checking purposes, four gyroscopes are used. All gyroscopes are set spinning, with their spin axis directed along the telescope to the guide star, which provides the reference direction for the gravity probe B measurements. This is where we assemble the probe, the heart of the experiment. Inside the probe are four gyroscopes. They are the devices that measure the relativistic effect we seek. They are the most spherical object ever machined by man and are made out of very homogeneous quartz and then coated with niobium. They are the most smooth object ever seen by man. They are smooth to several molecular layers. 
so almost perfectly round is a gyroscope that if magnified to the size of the Earth, its surface would still be extremely smooth. More than 3,000 times smoother than the Earth. Its highest mountains would measure no more than 8 feet or 2.4 meters. Cold and essentially free of all influences, except the relativistic ones, the gyroscopes spin in loneliest isolation. But if the gyroscopes are almost perfectly round and smooth and essentially free of all influences, how can then their spin axis be measured? And not only that, how can the predicted minute tilt be measured? The answer is through superconductivity. Each niobium-coated gyroscope is cooled to nearly absolute zero temperature and becomes superconductive. When it is set spinning, the positively charged atoms keep rotating but leave the extremely slippery electrons lagging behind. The net effect is an electrical current that generates a magnetic field with a magnetic polar axis. This axis is exactly aligned with the spin axis. To measure a change in a gyroscope spin direction or a tilt, the gyroscope is encircled with a loop connected to a magnetometer known as a squid or superconducting quantum interference device. As the gyroscope tilts, the magnetic polar axis tilts too and changes the magnetic field through the loop. So sensitive is the squid that a tilt by an angle of only 0.0001 arc second is detectable within a year. What is an angle of 0.0001 arc second? First picture angles of 45 degrees, 10 degrees and 1 degree and look at the diminishing space between the endpoints of the clothing lines that form the angle. To picture an angle of 0.0001 arc second, we have to go a long way to see the two lines opening at all. In fact, all the way from Paris to New York City. 0.0001 arc second is the angle of Lincoln's eye on a penny in New York City as seen from Paris. The hardest of all of our technologies, what was it? Now that the scientists have devoted so many years to the Gravity Pro B program, what do they think the test will show? Do they think that Einstein will be proven right? Or do they think that he may be proven wrong? What do you think the result will be? Oh, I always have a very straightforward reply for that. I don't care whether Einstein is right or wrong. What I want is the experimental truth. Final official flight go, no go status is now commencing. Flight? Go for lunch. C and DH? C and DH is go for lunch. Com? Com is go for lunch. Copy that. GPB is go Five, for lunch. Four, three, two, one. After the launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the satellite is put into a circular polar orbit at an altitude of about 400 miles or 650 kilometers. Then the satellite gets ready to lock on a bright guide star. All changes to the gyroscope spin directions are measured with respect to that star. However, any suitable guide star is relatively close to Earth and would be observed to move. 
The best guide star for gravity pro b, IM Pegasi, is also observed to be clearly in motion. Far better references for gravity pro b in contrast would be the most remote objects in the universe. Quasars, but they are too dim for the onboard telescope. The solution is to measure separately the motion of IM Pegasi relative to quasars and later correct for that motion so that finally the changes to the gyroscope spin directions can be related to the distant universe. Four different kinds of motion can be measured, two relatively large ones and two marginal ones. The relatively large motions are the parallax motion as an apparent motion of IM Pegasi relative to the distant background seen from the Earth as it orbits the Sun, and the proper motion of IM Pegasi within the galaxy. Both motions can be measured to distant quasars. The two marginal motions are the motion within IM Pegasi due to its binary nature and the jittery motion due to physical processes like flares on or near the surface of the bigger star of the binary system. The total motion of IM Pegasi in one year alone is 100 times larger than the smallest gyroscope spin axis changes measurable with Gravity Pro B. Clearly, this motion has to be determined with high accuracy for Gravity Pro B to be successful. The motion of IM Pegasi is determined with a technique of very long baseline interferometry, or in short, VLBI. This is at present the most accurate technique that we have to determine such motions. The most sensitive radio telescopes on Earth are used to determine IM Pegasi's motions. Altogether, 16 telescopes worldwide have taken part in the coordinated VLBI observations. They have observed as a network IM Pegasi simultaneously four times a year for several years. The path of the individual telescopes as the Earth rotates are used to synthesize a virtual gigantic radio antenna as big as the Earth itself. A hundred thousand gigabits of data are processed in each observation. Then the path of the individual pairs of telescopes trace out the dimensions of the gigantic synthesized antenna while the data are analyzed. The results are images of IM Pegasi and extremely accurate measurements of its motions with respect to the quasars. In fact, one of the most accurate such measurements ever made of a star. Gravity Pro B measures the minuscule tilting motions of the gyroscope spin axis with respect to IM Pegasi over the course of a year and sends the data down to the Mission Operation Center. At the end of this report, we'd like to switch the FrameX logging log file. Then the path of IM Pegasi itself across the sky is subtracted so that finally, after years of analysis, the motions of the gyroscope spin axis can be related to the distant universe. With the greatest accuracy, Gravity Pro B will measure the minute curving and warping of space-time near our Earth. Will the small gyroscope spin as predicted or not? Gravity Probe B is essentially a test of Einstein's concept of gravity and the universe. It boils down to a simple question. Was Einstein's view of the universe right or was it wrong? The answer to this question may have an immense impact on our understanding of nature as a whole and may help us to finally find a seamless, unified theory of our universe.